So, so one of the things that I was really hoping that um, we can do this morning is we, we speak about when we gather in more than uh, two or three that uh, we, we perform a purification ceremony. And today we call that a, a smudging ceremony. And so, so today I have uh, brought uh, sage and hopefully it doesn't get uh, too smoky. And <laughs> hopefully uh, for those who uh, have any uh, um, irritation to, to smoke, that um, at this time you might want to, to leave the room at this point. But um, for, for us as Indigenous people here in this territory, uh, the Anishinaabe people, we do this ceremony as a, as a purification. And the, the smoke we, we put over our heads and our, and our body. And the, the whole intention and purpose of it is to not only purify our spirits, okay, for, for us, our major philosophy is that we are spiritual beings first. So our duty then is to take care of our spiritual well-being. So this is for, for us is one of those ceremonies that we do to take care of ourselves. So when we talk about self-care, when we talk about a holistic approach, this is one of the ceremonies as to how to take care of your well-being. So, so for us, this is uh, very important. When we talk about the, a holistic approach as well, is for physical attributes to smudging with uh, this particular medicine. It allows people to, to share, so to engage in discussion and thought and feeling, but also when we speak of what we describe as the Chiba woman, and I'll hopefully explain a little bit more later, that uh, it's a very important concept for us. The, the other aspect is the mind. So for, for a lot of us, we use coffee to, to wake up in the morning and to be alert. And for us, when we smudge, that, that smoke automatically makes us alert. And, and that's the, the point of the smoke, is it is one of the quickest ways to consume a medicine. So we tend to focus on pills or fluids or um, ointments like creams or lotions. Another quick way is to, to inhale the smoke. So, so for us, this is very important <coughs> when we talk about our well-being and the, the needs that we need to, to do for, for us as human beings. So, so for this, I didn't uh, bring a lot of this today just because I, I figured the, the room was pretty, pretty small or um, usually uh, for, for this type of room, uh, we find that, that usually the, the smoke will go around uh, quite a bit. So, so at this time, we'll, we'll send the, the smudge around. And for those who are able, that uh, we ask that if, you, if you've had smudge before, if you can, and then we also respect those who, who wish not to as well. Can I ask Marianne to take this around, please? Just walk around the room with it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lighter too if you need to light it again. So one of the, the other things that we do when we when we gather in more than two or three is our other duty as human beings is to, to give gratitude to creation. And, and this is usually said in our language, 
and I'll do this at this time. Bonjour, Megazi Dodem, Awido Kaza, Bajgot, and Dijnakaz, Wasakthang, Nadonji, Yiwe, and Zibi, Nadonjaba, Jemanmat, Gay, Pawad, Min, Dao, Chimeguach, Kin, Gay, Go, Gajak, Tot, Nishan, Gijgat, Chimeguach, Atsokan, Asokanak, Chimeguach, Wabur, Omado, Jawan, Omado, Spinchmak, Mado, Giwan, Mado, Chimeguach, Aki, Chimeguach, Nyaki, Beneshi, Chimeguach, Majika, Chimigwach, Mashomas, Nokomas, Mananabojo, Nanwabe, Swabe, Nishode, Shakaka, Mamagwaswa, Nishnabe, Suck. Chimigwach, Menobamadzumin. Chimigwach, Dwevagan, Dwevanak, Puagan, Puaganak, Sheshigan, Sheshnak, Torkam, Torkmak. Chimigwach, Puaman, Bwamnak. Chimigwach, Dodem, Dodamak. At this time, we give our acknowledgments to the one who has created everything and everyone for this good day. We also give our acknowledgments to what we describe as the beings of the four directions. And for, for us, this is a, a very important concept in our teachings as Anishinaabe people. We also give acknowledgments to the many beings that have come before us. And I'll talk a little bit more about these, these beings later. We also give acknowledgments to what we describe as Mino Bamadzuin, that this is a, a good way of life. And we describe this for, for us, that we have many tools that we carry. And so some of these tools are here, our, our drums, our pipes, our shakers and other items that allow us to, to do this work. And we also describe that these tools allow us to attain and maintain this good way of life. So, so for us, when we give acknowledgments for, for these things, that we ask that we can do this in a good way, in a kind way. We also give our acknowledgments to what we describe as our as our head helpers. And for for us, we may see them or we may not. And and this is what we give acknowledgments to, that we've all come here for a purpose, uh, a reason for being or a goal or a hope or a dream as to why we've come on this journey. So we also give acknowledgments as well to what we describe as our dodem, dodemuk. And for us as indigenous people, this is a, a very important concept as when we talk about uh, who we are and our identity. And I'll be also mentioning this a little later as well. So all these things allow us to have a, a good way of life here. And, and this is what we give our acknowledgments for. When we also gather here, that uh, for, for us as an institution, that uh, we, are, we are very grateful for the opportunity um, to be able to, to work on this territory. And for, for us, when we give land acknowledgments, that uh, this is a, a very meaningful act for a lot of organizations now uh, across the country and around the world. And so this is uh, for, for us here at uh, USC, that this is uh, when, we, when we talk about our, our land acknowledgement, that it is to, to recognize and give that gratitude and respect to the, the nations that are here, and also the, the original nations that were here at one time. So, so for us, as, as an institution, that uh, we, we give that acknowledgement. And for, for us, that uh, on this territory, specifically here in Scarborough, that this was a home territory to the Seneca, the Wyandotte, and the, the Mississaugas. And for, for us here, that the Mississaugas were 
uh, a nation that are part of the, the Ojibwe. Um, so the Ojibwe people have many different uh, dialects uh, within uh, their, their nations. So, so within the, the Ojibwe, the, the Mississaugas fall under the Ojibwe. There's the Potawatomi, which uh, that's a, a nation that I'm part of. Those are the, the keepers of the fire. And then there's also uh, an old Ojibwe that we describe as uh, Jamandamuk. And there are people with uh, excellent memories. And across the Americas, they were known as the memorizers. And then there's uh, today what a lot of people refer to as the, the Chippewa, which tend to be a more of a southern dialect and most commonly known today in the Americas. And as well, as you go more north, you go into uh, Soto territory. And so you see uh, a different dialect up there with a mix of uh, Cree. And then around here, what's um, pretty, pretty strong is the Odawa. So, so those are the, the major dialects and nations that are affiliated with uh, what is commonly known as as the Ojibwe today. So, so for us, this is uh, we we give our acknowledgments to these nations, and as well as our Ongoihoe brothers and sisters, and those are the nations of the six nations, the the Mohawk, the Seneca. There's there's many more, and I'll I'll be mentioning more of them later. So, so I'm very thankful for for today, and. I'm very thankful that we're able to, to join together in, in this way. And for, for myself, when I was asked to, to speak, um, this is a, a very important topic for, for myself. That, um, education has been uh, very, very close to, to my heart and uh, the work that I do. And... So that is something that I was really hoping that uh, we could share uh, a lot of um, the, the history that uh, has been able to occur to, to get us to the point that we are here today. And I'm very thankful for Karen uh, giving me that uh, great introduction. <laughs> and so one of the things that um, I had uh, originally thought about um, I was like, I knew she was uh, going to be doing an introduction, and I wanted to, to share more as to uh, coming here today, uh, what more could, could I share um, that might not be um, in, in my introduction. So, so I guess some, some background about me, um, our family was greatly involved in the in the art industry and so so that was a lot of my my early upbringing was around the the arts and music in particular and one one being was uh norvell um he was a a well-known ojibwe artist and this this type of art that uh, that he did is is described as a, a woodlands art, and so for for us uh, when we talk about um, our people um, having permission to share uh, this knowledge, uh, he was one of the ones that had uh, received permission from elders. In, in his territory to, to share uh, this, this knowledge. And I'll go more into the, the teachings about that later. But his student was also uh, Brian, and as well, uh, the same style of uh, Woodlands art as well. And the, the two of them were very influential in, in my life. 
as to uh, being so close to the to the art industry and and this person as well uh, Basil uh, he was uh, born in Wasoxing First Nation which uh, that's where I'm from and he was a, a well-known author and linguist in the Ojibwe language and he was also the, the curator for the Royal Ontario Museum. And so, so one of the things for, for myself that, uh, you know, because we were all family, that uh, we were always at the ROM. And so we got to, you know, be in the, the archives and the, the storage and to, to be able to actually um, see a lot of those ceremonial items that usually weren't shared in the public. And so, so Basil was able to, to share those items with us. And, and sadly, he, he did end up retiring. And, um, and then Trudy took over for uh, his position. And then now she's retired. Um, so, so it's been really good to, to see that type of uh, history shared with our community. I wanted to, to mention as well, um, also did some, some acting as well. And, and this was a, a film that uh, we had done a while ago. Uh, this was uh, with uh, W.P. Kinsella. And, and this book, for, for those who haven't read it, um, it's a fictional story, but it was a very powerful story as to giving insight as to indigenous communities. And so you, you see a lot about, the, um, sadly, about the, the issues that a lot of indigenous communities face as to uh, addictions and poverty and racism and uh, sadly about murder as well. So, so a lot of different uh, issues as to um, what a lot of indigenous communities face. So, so for this, um, that was one of the, the reasons why I supported this film, what, what actually occurs in our communities. And then, um, very, like I said, um, uh, used to do a lot of writing, and so um, I had advocated uh, back in the early 90s as to uh, I wanted to, to see more Indigenous women published because uh, at that time uh, there, was, there was very few uh, Indigenous women uh, being published. So, so a group of us had uh, gotten together and so this was uh, the first of, of many uh, series that uh, we had started back then. So, so for us, it was an achievement to, to be able to start a lot of the careers of, of current writers that are still writing today. And then for, for myself, I've um, been dancing uh, quite a long time. And uh, on, I guess on your left is uh, some of my cousins. And then on my right, this is my, my son and I. And he has a, a big bear as his, uh, as his outfit. So this is a, a picture that we had done together. And then as a singer, um, like I said, I, I grew up with uh, singing and dancing and around the, the arts and we had started uh, Nishinaabe Kwe Singers back in the back in the early 90s, and after after that, then we started uh, Daughters of the Earth, and and both groups uh, we traveled across across North America, and we would do uh, and perform at different uh, schools and functions, and so it was uh, that was pretty much the, the beginning for, for myself as to uh, speaking in public and, and going to lectures and, 
and, and doing performances in, in a public setting. And so, so for me, this, is, uh, this has been a long time as to um, being in, the, in a public setting and, and, and talking and, and, and doing this. So for myself, um, with, with education, one of the, the biggest things is always the discussion of history. And one of the things that is most commonly told to all of us is the, the Bering Strait theory. And, and this is something for, for us, for, for many indigenous nations across Turtle Island especially, that uh, we don't believe in this theory. <laughs> so, so for us, this is the, the sad thing for, for us in Canada as to the indigenous rights, especially when we speak of uh, land titlement, is there's a word in Latin the, that describes that this is no man's land. And, and this is sadly for us um, when we do any of our treaties or land negotiations that this is probably the, the biggest term that sets us back. And, and this is something for, for us <coughs> as when we come into negotiations that uh, we tend to find this is the, the biggest setback. And then from that uh, is described as uh, the doctrine of discovery and then the, the concepts of possession. So, so this is for us, these are our two main areas that sort of implicate one another as to, um, because the, the concept that uh, we don't own the land, then how can you then possess it and if we were not here based on the Bering Strait theory, then the whole notion then validates the, the doctrine of discovery. So all these issues complicate one another when we talk about indigenous rights. And, and this is one area that uh, for us, we still face today. And this is one of the things that when we talk about a passage of time, that this is the unfairness in our justice system. And this is one, how it was explained to me, was uh, actually through my parents. And it was actually through my father. And he said, there's, there's one thing I have to teach you. And he says, the, the treaty that we're under is one from 1850 and he says what that means is he says because of this clause of the passage of time is you need to know how to function back in 1850 in order for your rights as an indigenous person to be valid and he said if you do not understand or function as an indian from 1850 then you have no rights. So from that point forward, he taught me traditionally as to how everything was done, as to ceremonies, to belief systems, to functions, to cooking, like everything. And, and that was the reason why. As, as a Canadian, you're not stuck in 1850. You can live as 2019. But based on this clause, we can't. And, and that's the unfairness that we speak about when we talk about Indigenous rights. So, so this is why I brought up um, all those other clauses, is in 1763, that for, for us, why this document is so important is that it validates indigenous rights 
and title to land. So, so for us, this is a, a very important document as to it also validates the treaties that exist and that also pre-existed. So this is for, for us, I don't know if um, it's kind of faded, but um, these are the, the, the treaties across the country. And in this territory, um, where I'm from, is the, the Huron-Robinson Treaty of 1850. And so I'm from uh, Wasoxing First Nation, which is Perry Sound. So it's, uh, it's not too far from here. But uh, for, for us, um, my, my father's side of the, the family, they had uh, agreed to this treaty. And then my mother's side of the family, uh, they, they refused to sign the treaty. <laughs> so two, two different uh, reasonings as to why, why they agreed and disagreed. And I'll speak more about this uh, shortly. And my button is not working. So one of the things that had occurred during the Huron-Robinson Treaty so, so one of the things that um, uh, where, where my knowledge comes from is uh, on, on both sides of our family that uh, we had hereditary chiefs um, on, on both sides of our, our family at different times. And one of the, the stories of the 1850 treaty negotiations was um, they, they had a question that had come up to the chiefs. And the question was, what would it take for you to, to give up your, uh, your, your government? And so, so they had said, well, you would need to replicate our, our governing system. And so at that point, uh, the team of negotiators had split up. And the, the one team had then stayed with the, the treaty negotiations. And then the, the other side started what is now today the, the Indian Act. So they were developing the, the framework for the Indian Act. So, so sadly, uh, today, uh, this is now uh, looked upon as um, an act that is uh, racist and um, a lot of people say that it's uh, discriminatory and and when you look at it in like a human rights lens yes you know and and currently it has it has violated uh, a few provisions under the human rights code and so so this is for us, uh, when we when we look at the, the original Indian Act, that it was to fulfill what we speak about in all the different treaties across Canada. So, uh, a lot of the the treaties across Canada, some were very similar, and some were very different, and. So the, the Indian Act was created to ensure that the, that the treaties were being fulfilled. So, so for us, this is, um, when, when you looked at the, the, the original Indian Act, that um, it had really put a lot of framework that uh, sadly has created a, a lot of racism today and a lot of stigma that um, continues today that we face. So, so this is the, the hard truth as to the, the Indian Act, and hopefully we got time to, to speak about some of those things. But um, it was to, to sadly, um, when, we, when we look at um, the dismantle of ownership and land and governance and, and things like that, um, 
that's that's what a lot of this act does to the indigenous peoples. So one of the things that it also does when we talk about reserves is that it sets aside land in trust. And so this is one of the, the hardest things for a lot of Canadians to, to understand is that uh, for Indigenous peoples, that uh, then we don't own the, the land. And so this is uh, one of the, the hardest things is in um, looking at that uh, concept of ownership. And this has been a continuous challenge uh, to the Indian Act. And, and sadly, it's one of the, the hardest things today as to uh, when we talk about the, the differences, um, meaning that when we, when we talk about the, um, the, the concept of, of trust, you know, as, as, as a status person, that for, for myself, <coughs> that uh, I cannot, even, even today with all my assets, that uh, I cannot will them to, uh, to my children. That because of this concept of trust, it is given to the crown. So, so this is one of the, the hard things today, is um, as a status Indian, that all my assets go to Indian affairs. <laughs> So, so that's the, the sad thing in all this is a lot of that still continues today. So, so one of the things that I quickly wanted to mention, especially when we speak of education, is when we speak about the, the intention of, of education. And this was the, the first Prime Minister of Canada, John A. Macdonald, and it was very clearly noted that um, the, the Indians were to, to be assimilated. And that was a, a very clear intention. And, and this is what started the, the residential school era. And, and this is uh, sadly for uh, a lot of indigenous peoples have um, traumatically been impacted by, by the effects of uh, residential schools. So all those little dots are all residential schools that were across the, the country. And, and sadly, the, the last one closed in 1996. Uh, so like even one of our, our kids um, went to one of the, the last residential schools. So, so this was, uh, uh, a lot of you might know, um, Duncan Campbell Scott. Um, and this is, again, another uh, quote about uh, Indian residential schools. And, and this is, for, for us, uh, we were seen as a, as a problem of Canada. Uh, we, were, we were not... Uh, seen as humans even at that point. So for <coughs> Indian residential schools, that uh, one in 25 students um, would, would survive. And then in uh, World War II, one in 26. Uh, this is Thomas More on the, on the left when he entered this residential school, and this is him again on, on the right. So when we, when we talk about education, that uh, there's, there's many aspects that we speak about as to um, looking at a accountability of education and, and who would uh, traditionally oversee or supervise an educational process. And, and this is where we speak about the concept of learning and earning. We speak about our knowledge keepers, our elders, and our law keepers. We also look at the different clans 
and families and also societies that our nations also have that uh, would track this type of learning. And I put this here because this is, um, it's, it's a universal symbol. And, but uh, for us as Ojibwe people, that uh, this is a traditional calendar that we had used. And so for, for this, when it's a 10 talon thunderbird, that uh, it is describing a 500 million year calendar. And each talon represents 50 million years. And so for, for us, when we talk about uh, history, that uh, there's, there's a lot of history that uh, we, we hold. So I had spoken about that uh, there was many beings that have come before us. And, and this is for us when we talk about our creation story and how we have evolved as human beings, that this is uh, the beings that we, we describe in, in our creation story. So when we describe Anishinaabe, uh, that is describing you and I. And so Nokomis and Mashomis were the, the previous beings before us. And Wanana Bojo was the, the being before them. And, and this being is a, a very important being as um, our, our number system is, is actually right in the, the word. So Wananin is actually the number five, and Nin is four, Swe is three, Nish is two, and then when we describe one, it is describing three. So for, for us, when we, uh, when we talk about these, these beings, that uh, this story alone uh, goes back about 65 million years of time. So, so for us, when we, when we talk about our evolution as human beings, it's, um, it's a long story. <laughs> so, so just quickly, that um, when we talk about our creation story as Anishinaabe, that uh, we speak about uh, what, what a lot of people describe today as uh, the mind, body, spirit. And for, for us, that last component is describing the laws. And we describe the laws of creation as there are great laws, and the, the great laws is what we describe as creator's laws. And then we speak about our universal laws, and, and that's what governs the universe. And in our teachings, our, our universe is, is really big. <laughs> and so there are different laws that uh, govern the, the universe. And, and then when we speak of natural laws, the natural laws are specifically to this earth. So we only have our, our earth itself. And then the, the tribal laws describe the, the laws of our nations. So, so for these, that's what uh, governs us then as human beings. So what makes us up as a human being is that each of us has a spirit, each of us has a body, each of us has a mind, and then what we describe as uh, the Chibu woman. And, and this is what emanates from us. So this is what activates when we're born, and then it deactivates when we die. And, and this is what they, they describe as the, the process of death is these four coming together as one. So for us, when we talk about our governing system, 
Um, and this is why in the beginning of this presentation I had mentioned that um, for a lot of the, the reasons for Doctrine of Discovery is that uh, we did not have a governing system or laws. And so this is sort of what I was hoping to, to share with you in the next few minutes is that the, the nations here on, on Turtle Island had many different laws and, and many different treaties amongst ourselves. So, <laughs> so the Ojibwe, so this is uh, what I am, and, and the, the Haudenosaunee, um, so the, the people of the Six Nations, that uh, we historically fought uh, for a very long time. And so uh, one of the things that, um, you know, we had uh, agreed to different treaties with, with the Haudenosaunee. And uh, so this is uh, one of those treaties, and that is the, the two row. And the, the two row was used by the Six Nations with many other nations. So it was used with the Dutch, it was used with the 13 colonies, and it was also used amongst other indigenous nations within North America. And so when we talk about the, the two row, that the, the one purple line is describing uh, that nation of the six nations and then the, the other nation that they are in treaty with. So, so whether it's uh, Ojibwe or, or whether it was the Dutch or the 13 colonies, but the, the concept is, is that we would respect one another's laws and we would not, we would not interfere with another nation's laws. And so this is what, for us in this territory, so the, the Beaver Bowl Treaty is, is one, and this is uh, as Scarborough. Uh, this is the, the treaty that governs Scarborough, is the, the Beaver Bowl Treaty. Um, the, the Beaver Bowl Treaty was basically from here almost to Ottawa, uh, to Lake Ontario. And then some nations would say as far as James Bay. Um, and then others say to pretty much just north of uh, Sudbury. And then some would say less, meaning that uh, it was around the French River where the dividing line was. So, so there's different stories as to the, the actual mass of the territory. But the, the beaver bowl, so this was seen as the, the bowl, and that was seen as the, the spoon. And the concept is, is that this territory was, was seen as a, a wealth that one nation could not keep it to itself. And so there was always a lot of fighting uh, going on in this territory <coughs> and this this territory was was known not only for its fishing but uh, <coughs> different resources of, of wild rice and hunting and so it was it was a very well well resourced area so so this was uh, for for us when we agreed to this this treaty was that uh, we would not fight in this territory. So, so this was the agreement that was made amongst many different nations that when we would enter this territory that we would not fight. That when we would enter this territory <coughs> that we would understand that it was used for gathering resources that our communities may need. So, so this is one that um, a lot of the nations uphold. And for us as Ojibwe people, our, our governing system 
has a creation, has a structure, privileges, roles, responsibilities, a governing system as to uh, how it's developed and the risks, and also how it's managed. So for, for us, this is how the scroll looked originally. And um, it, uh, there, there was originally five. And in our scrolls, when a being was upside down or sideways, it was seen as it was dead. And so only the, the five survived. And then when we talk about the, the different privileges that uh, we speak of five. So for a community to be able to have a, uh, a good way of existing, that uh, you need the, the first four. So you got to have providers, protectors, leaders, and healers. And once your community is functioning with those four, then you're able to, to learn, you're able to grow. And the, the concept of innovation and change is impossible. So these are the different, uh, how this is related to creation is that with, with our system that um, these beings are the oldest beings in our creation. So, so meaning out of the, the reptiles, uh, one of the oldest reptiles are, are turtles. Out of the birds, the oldest reptile is the, the crane, which goes back about 70 million years. So that's, that's part of the reasons why uh, these, these animals were, were chosen. And based on the territory, uh, meaning the, the abundance of those particular animals, they would then be used as part of the clan system. So how this would work is I've said that I'm part of the, the bald eagle clan. And so because it, it's a bird, it would fall under the cranes. So that means then all of our teachings that I was raised with first, that they were all based on leadership and governance. And so for, for us, uh, that's the concept is, is those are your, your first teachings. And so our clan system uh, would, one, it would maintain those laws that I'd spoken about. So the, the great laws, universal laws, natural laws, tribal laws. And it would also teach you about the, the morals of the clan, sustainability, give you a place to belong. So what this means is if your parents had died while you were a child, that uh, you still had the concept of the family. And uh, the purpose of the clan was to ensure a better quality of life and then to also maintain the, the, the different blood types. The governing councils is one, this is um, another concept as well that I'll, I'll mention um, in a few slides. But uh, for us as Ojibwe, that our clan system also did have uh, clan mothers. So it was uh, a female leadership. And like I had mentioned, the, the five privileges. And this is the, the grand council. So, so this was um, for, for us when we would meet on one side of the lodge would be the, the male, and then the other side would be the female. And they would then be divided amongst the, the elders, the adults, and then the, the youth. And then what's different is, is children had a voice. So children would have a council of their own. 
and and this is uh, you know for for all of us who've had kids, you know that uh, you would see kids fight and they would stop fighting, you know, in a couple minutes usually, and and then they can continue playing, and so it's this type of philosophy that uh, when we when we talk about children that they can teach us and and guide us and. Where, where a lot of us as adults were pretty stubborn and uh, we can hold grudges for generations. <laughs> so, so this is something uh, a little bit different. Uh, Grand Council was used amongst North, Central, and South America. This was not a governing council for here. And so this was a system um, how we know this story is our great great uncle was a linguist for this lodge and he knew over 30 indigenous languages across North Central and South America that he would be one of the, the linguists for this lodge so so that's how we know as to how it existed in, in the framework to it so when we speak of the, the morals, that um, there are seven that um, you need to be able to be truthful and to be kind and to have courage and to share, to love and to have humility and to, to do all that in an honorable way. And the, the hope is, is that you're able to instill these morals in your children and so that they can uphold these morals within their belief system so so for us this was uh, essential to child development and when we speak about how education occurred that um, this is where the the arts and the music were essential in teaching and learning and so for us, our, our birch bark scrolls uh, were, were very important as to how we taught. Um, this is uh, traditionally uh, was a mathematical symbol. And that would actually describe millions of years of time. And the the boxes and the circles and then the beings uh, break down that number to to a very specific number of time as to what part of creation that they were speaking of. The other ways that we had taught was through petroglyphs. And, and this one on the bottom right is... Um, I think that one's in Peterborough, and I think that one is a uh, pipestone. And in Peterborough, they have over uh, 2,000 images on, on their petroglyphs. And, and same thing, each of them, all the, the different beings talk about uh, different, different teachings and, and different parts of creation. And sadly, we don't um, we don't uh, see many people teaching that way anymore. So that's uh, a sad loss for 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 the way our current education is going. And then uh, the other way is uh, pictographs and. This is up in um, Bon Echo Park, and uh, for for those who haven't been there, I I would suggest a, it's a beautiful a beautiful ride to get there, but also uh, it's a beautiful location, and so for for us the the pictographs are put on rock faces, and this is um, for for us there are many of them. Um, truthfully across Turtle Island and, and each of them hold different uh, teachings as to again different parts of creation 
So this is for, for us, what brings us together is um, what uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission had uh, started uh, quite some time ago. And this is uh, for, for us, that uh, it's a commission that started in 2008. And the final report was given in 2015. And this is a, a very important commission for Canada as to it is the, the beginning of uh, reconciliation here. And so the hope is that um, many educational institutions would support the, the TRC recommendations. And there are specific ones for education and post-secondary. And, and this is what uh, the presidents from different universities from across Canada had made a commitment in 2016 to, to support the, the TRC. And for, for us here at U of T, uh, we created our own recommendations and been able to uh, successfully do quite a bit of them. Um, so, so this is uh, part of my work here. Is um, like I said, uh, I've I've done many things in my lifetime, but like I said, education has been my passion, and. I have volunteered on, on many different uh, education committees on college and university levels and been the, the chairs of a few of them. And, but uh, overall, probably 20 years of, of being on those different committees and, and seeing different um, educational initiatives and programs and services delivering to Indigenous students, uh, mostly here in, in Canada. Uh, I've done some work in the United States, but mostly it's, uh, it's been up here. So, so this is what has uh, partially brought me to, to U of T, is the implementation of the TRC and, and their work plan. So, so this is for, for us, it has, um, driven a, a lot of the, the work that we're currently doing here. So our hope is, is that this year we can provide a, a good report as to, you know, some of the successes that we've been able to, to do this year. When we speak about other universities across the country, that um, the, the first uh, native program uh, that existed was actually at Trent University that started in uh, 1970. And, and they were also um, the, the first to also hire indigenous faculty. And, and I'm also gonna say too that um, they, they didn't need degrees like uh, we require today. So, so meaning uh, if they were knowledge keepers or um, you know, had that commitment to education, uh, that they were brought on as, as faculty. And, and most programs across the country have indigenous counselors, and then they usually have some type of coordinator to, to coordinate uh, events and activities for their, their particular uh, university. So this is what's, what's common today that you see. Uh, the other common thing that you see that's pretty popular is uh, powwows. Is um, most universities today have them? There's there's very few that uh, that don't have them today. And for us, you know, this is uh, some of the things I speak about as to what makes us unique as UFT. And this is uh, what we speak about is what what we're facing is. Sadly, our indigenous people are not succeeding in the current education system. And so that was one of the, the first questions that were brought up to me, was why aren't indigenous students succeeding? And so I had actually went back to the elders and um, had asked them. 
And back then we, we all sat down. And so there was that conversation going on. And then simultaneously, that um, uh, for us as a family, um, our family carries different uh, prophecies. And, and one of those prophecies uh, speak about knowledge, and particularly our knowledge. And that uh, it, it states in there that we're not to share knowledge until 2000. And so this is um, for, for us, when, when 2000 came, I had asked my, my family, I said, well, you know, 2000 is coming and would like to begin sharing this, this knowledge. And so they said, go, you know, you can go do that. And so at that time, I had approached U of T, uh, the, the School of Medicine. And, uh, and sadly, I got declined. And um, they said, you know, our, we got too much curriculum, you know. And so I was in the hallway, and one of the students had come up to me and said, um, what happened? And so, so I told them, I said, this is what happened. And they said, well, we're part of the student association, and we would like you to, to speak. And so that, from that point forward, um, they had introduced us to uh, the Native Student Association. And together, um, they started coming out for, for ceremonies. Um, I run um, different ceremonies throughout the year. And they had started to ask if they could participate. So, so we welcomed them to, to come. And so that was uh, 19 years ago now. <laughs> so, so this is uh, one of the things that we spoke about that we felt as, as ceremonialists and uh, knowledge keepers and and the different elders we worked with at that time, that we felt that this was a, a good way and a safe way to encourage students to, to learn and to, to be on the land, to, to be immersed in community. And it was a safe space for, for them to, to feel comfortable. And especially uh, we found that uh, a lot of urban students um, don't don't get um, like a, a bush experience, and so this provides that opportunity. And so so for us, uh, we we run this uh, twice a year, and like I said, this is uh, one of the the highlights that we do. What I would like to see in the the future is. Um, to have more ceremonial spaces on campus, uh, so to, to see more teepees outside. Uh, this is one of my uh, ceremonial lodges. This one's uh, 64 feet long, this one. And it's uh, quite wide. Um, one of the, the organizations that we work with um, is, um, Native Child and Family Services of Toronto that's located uh, downtown on uh, 30 College Street. And they, they had asked us, uh, can we replicate your lodge? And um, I said, sure. So, so they brought out their architects and, and um, they, they made all the, the measurements and uh, we designed this. And so this is uh, half the length of our ceremonial lodge. So, so this is uh, 32 feet long. And so this was uh, an innovative uh, design as to uh, when we talk about our, our ceremonial structures. That um, one of the things I had uh, <coughs> wished and still wish that um, I always 
try to, to think about 50 years from now or 100 years from now, you know, what are our ceremonies going to look like? You know, what are those structures? Where are they going to be? You know, and how can we include them uh, in our lives today in the structures we have today? And so, so that was one of the, you know, the questions I had asked uh, when we were designing this is um, I wanted to ensure that children, you know, even if they were brought up in the city, that uh, they could still have an authentic process and opportunity that um, they may not get like 50 or 100 years from now. So, so this was uh, one of the structures that we worked with and um, quite happy with how it works. Because uh, this is a traditional structure, <laughs> and and sadly it's uh, saplings, and um, you know those are not too common today. So, so for us moving forward, you know we got a lot of work to do. Uh, for us as Indigenous people, we speak about um, our our duties that um, we need to uphold. On, on both sides, not only the crown, but us as indigenous people as well. And there's different cases um, that support uh, indigenous rights that have been very good uh, so far as to the Dalgamak case, as to uh, being able to look at uh, title and oral tradition. Um, when we look at different methodologies as to how we taught, traditionally it was oral tradition. And, but I also shown you that uh, we also had different scrolls and syllabics that uh, really supported our, our ways of teaching and learning. And I had mentioned these earlier as to um, who was accountable for this knowledge. The problems that we face today is um, we, we have many nations across the country. And so there's many different definitions that a lot of us um, might not be too familiar about. And, and that's what brings us to, even with Anishinaabe, um, that even with Anishinaabe, it's describing that um, we're, we're human beings, we're good beings, we're water beings. Our, our language is very descriptive. So I was really hoping to, to show that with all this, that um, this is the, the real risk with the concept of indigenous is um, we, we like to, to group people together. <laughs> and um, that's uh, the hardest thing today is uh, that we're, we're quite diverse. So, so the hope is, like uh, I had mentioned, the, the prophecies that um, for, for us uh, in, in our teachings that we have uh, the eighth prophecy. And for us, it means that we're allowed to share now our, our knowledge. And the, the hope is, is that the TRC is the, the first step, you know, when we talk about reconciliation. And the hope is, is that our, our future generations will be stronger, they'll be healthier. And hopefully we can move forward in a, a good way together. So this is a thank you and miigwech. Thank you for listening. That uh, it, was, it was very great to, to have all of you here. And, um, I'll invite uh, Karen back up here if she's still here, and we'll take some questions. Miigwech. Very superior, and therefore there's nothing to offer from the other side. 
Now, you've sort of shown us a few ways that you know, we could be involved more, but I'm wondering, is there any other ways that perhaps the culture and, uh, oh, sorry, are there any other ways that the culture and all of the wonderful things that your beliefs have could be incorporated or we could perhaps listen more, make this more of a two-way street? Hmm. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what we what we describe this today, and with the with the TRC especially, is the the concept of um, the the concept of um, allyship, and and this is for for us probably the the most important concept is is understanding the the role as to being being a good ally and and this is something that um, we hope that um, that both sides so so meaning as as Canadians and as indigenous peoples that uh, both parties will engage in one another in in good relations and and that's something that you know for um, you know, when we, when we talk about nationhood, that this is, this is what we, we, we speak about as Indigenous people, like how, how I was taught, was um, you don't want to start a war. <laughs> so, so you don't want to tell another nation how to function. So, so that's something that um, was always the, the notion how we were taught as to, you know, you, you want to tell Canada that, yeah, they, they need to uphold their, their allyship, but we can't tell you how to do that. And, and that's something where, you know, we talk about respecting each other as separate nations that you know we don't want to be disrespectful in that sense but also the the way we were always told was that uh, you know always be careful you don't want to start a war <laughs> so so that was always that notion but saying that you know one of the things for for us how how allyship was always described to me was with with our parents was that when world war one and world war two had started that our communities stood up and that was one of the things that really confused me um, was why did they do that and that was because truthfully, you know, like uh, I, I personally didn't understand that. And, and that was the one thing that uh, my, my elders had shared with me was to, to be a good ally is that you would, you would fight for one another. And, and that's what being an ally is about that you uphold the, the principles that had brought you together. And, and that's what we fight for. That what has brought us together as Canadians and Indigenous people is that we share this territory and that we do it in a peaceful way and that we can share these resources. And so that was always uh, the intent. And the way our elders had always believed was that then our duty is then to, to fight for that. And so, so that was always something that, for myself, when we, when we speak about that, then how does that work out then in our day-to-day -day life? How, how do we ensure then 
that same quality is passed on to each generation to, to uphold those types of principles and to, to value those types of principles. And, and to me, that's the work that we both need to do, is to ensure that our children know those things so we can eliminate any risks or future risks to our existence. So, so that is one, you know, I believe is our, our duty as, as individuals in, in our own little family clusters that, uh, that we can do is to ensure that our children and our families know as to what, what those principles are and to, to know that if they're called upon, that they, they have that willingness and understanding then to, to fight for that. Um, so hopefully that gives you a sense as to, you know, for, for today, you know, that's a, a question that everybody's been asking is how, you know, whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous, how do we do that today? And so that has been, I think, the, probably the biggest question. <laughs> Oh. Oh. It's red. Oh, the battery's out. The battery's out of it. Oh. It's gone all red. I don't know. Uh, you know what? Hang on. Why don't we use that one? Just use the microphone yeah. then? Okay. Yeah, that died. Is this one on? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I have a question. Uh, it deals with the uh, touching ceremony, which is the start of this. This is a very important ceremony among Indigenous people. And I would like to know when is it used among the Indigenous people, and does the average Indigenous person participate in it? Hmm. Very good questions. <laughs> So I'll start off with uh, your, your second question first. Is, um, and I had mentioned uh, the people of the Six Nations that um, they, they don't smudge. So that is um, not a practice that they do, but they, they burn tobacco. So, but they don't smudge with it though. They just, they just burn it. So, so there are some nations that, that don't have that concept of, of smudging. And then there's, there's a few more nations that, that don't smudge either. So, so it's, not, it's not a common practice amongst all indigenous nations. So that's something just to like, be aware of. But um, truthfully, I have to admit that... Um, there's a lot more allergies today. <laughs> There's a lot of people allergic to smoke. Like, um, and it's, it's becoming really common. So um, I used to, to be a director and, and one of my employees, uh, she, was, she was allergic to smoke. And so every time that we smudged, she had to, to leave to leave the room every time we smudge because of because of her allergy. So, so sadly, uh, because of medical reasons today, you're seeing a, a lot less uh, smudging going on, and you're seeing other ceremonies uh, taking place now in in a lot of urban centers. So, meaning that um, people are are using tobacco ties. I was going to bring one instead of um, instead of smudging too so so that's been another component the the other thing i wanted to share too is when when we smudge that um it could it could be that um, 
meaning that the, usually the beginning of all of our ceremonies, we, we always begin with a smudge. And the, the concept is that uh, whenever there is grief, that we are to smudge. So, so say that, uh, that somebody shares a, a personal loss and they start crying. Well, we would smudge. We would light that smudge. And, and then say like another 20 minutes, somebody else uh, starts crying uh, about something else. Same thing, we would light that smudge again. So, so I hope you get the idea that whenever there's like, um, like grief or anger or hurt, that that's when we are to, to smudge. Because the, the concept is, is all those things hold uh, different energy. And a lot of it is like a negative or toxic energy. And we don't want people to carry that. So the concept is, is we want people to let that go. So that's the, the purpose behind the smudge. And so that people have that opportunity to let that go. But for us, uh, there's hundreds and thousands of different types of medicines. And each one of them does something different for us as human beings so so this is the other component is other smudges will will help us in different ways so so this is the other important thing when we talk about smudging is it can it can really be beneficial to what we would want to achieve in a group like this depending on the the smudge that we want to use so, so hopefully that gives you some thoughts. Thank you very much for this very good. I really appreciate your comment. So, um, it seems to me that your, your title is an elder, that there's a tremendous respect um, for the elderly within your community. And I, I know the older I get, I realize the best teacher I've ever had is time. And the older I get, the more I learn the smarter. Um, and I contrast that with the, the pop culture notion of, of youth today, this worship of youth, you know, forever young, forever 21, empty wrinkle cream, and, and everybody's going to stay young forever. And isn't that great? And I'm thinking, well, oh, maybe not so much. I'm not so sure about that. So I guess my question for you is do the indigenous youth um, feel the same sort of pressure to worship youth? And if they do, how do you maintain the respect for the elder that is so important and central um, to your survival? Mm. Another good question. <laughs> um, I would start with um, when we when we talk about our our youth. That um, this oh. is a, a group that currently that not too many of them have much experience today with, with elders. Um, this is probably the, the sad component as to the state of our communities, is the, the livelihood of our elderly population. Um, I'll give you the example with our family that um, sadly in our community that um, they usually don't live beyond 50 and and that is for many different reasons as to poverty addiction but sadly it's the chronic health issues of diabetes and currently it's cancer um, we're almost seeing a hundred percent issues in people over the, the age of 50 that are, are dealing with multiple issues and there are chronic health issues. So, so this is our, our concerns right now and, 
especially in the next few years, is, you know, with, with this aging population, how, how is that going to affect the, the community? And especially when these are to, to be our teachers, that uh, we're, we might see a, a big gap, you know, in, in this relationship. So, so this is the sad thing is that state um, has, has really existed in our communities for quite some time. And so that notion of having a relationship with elders um, isn't too common today. Um, this is one of the things as to uh, that the other reason why I have really committed myself to education was probably about a decade ago that uh, we, we were doing um, an award ceremony for post-secondary and uh, we had about, um, gosh, probably about 200 students in post-secondary in the room. And we had asked if they were all graduates and they all raised their, their hands. And, and then uh, we had asked, well, were any of you taught by your elders? And not one of them put up their hands. And, and that was devastating when, when I saw that. And so, so to me, you know, we're, we're in a crisis as to that relationship between youth and elders is you're not seeing that enough you know and this is the the other reason why like i'm really hoping the the current education system will continue to support uh elders in particular is that that relationship will still continue you know, and, and still exist. So, so that's, that's the hope, that's the, the wish. Um, sadly, with a lot of our youth today, because they don't have um, a relationship that uh, today, uh, a lot of the youth are almost scared. Um, not because it's that lack of relationship. So, so it is one that, um, like even with the elders that I speak to, a lot of them tend not to uh, spend a lot of time with, with youth. They, they tend to spend a lot of their time with, uh, you know, older adults. So one of the things that we had noticed in our ceremonies is that there's a gap so meaning we get a lot of children and then we see young adults and the gap is the youth that they're they're not they're not coming out for for ceremonies so so that's something that we see and so that's something that we've often spoke about as to how how can we change that and so for, for us as elders that we talk to, we really try to encourage them to, um, you know, be, be more encouraging, you know, to that population and to, to keep an uh, open door for them. And so, so the hope is, is that, you know, the, the, the way the education system is going, hopefully they'll be more inclusive as to elders and maintaining that relationship because it is it is essential in our learning and so i'll, I'll leave it at that miigwech uh, there's a question over on the windows please okay. yeah. when we okay hey <laughs> <laughs> yell enough <laughs> ourselves as not myself, okay? Not in the moment. Let's say you are talking with Sherry in 2000. Would you want me to go and share what I have learned today 
even though I have no indigenous blood, we'll put it that way, for one of a better word. In other words, who should do the sharing? And what is acknowledged as being acceptable for the tribe? Yep, good question. <laughs> So I had um, spoken earlier about the, the process of uh, learning and earning. And, and what does that mean? And, and this is um, what, what I share here um, with, with a lot of uh, the, the faculty. And, and when we speak about this notion of allyship is... In the, the process of learning and earning, that as, as a learner, each of us has the, the right to, to share our own personal learning, like our reflection in that learning. And, and that's, that's the, the right we have as a learner. And this is the, the difference in when we speak of earning is when, when you earn the right to, to teach it, then that's when you can actually share, share the knowledge that is not from your own personal um, experience. So, so that is something that for us when we speak of earning, is you go through a process of testing. You go through a process of evaluation. And, you know, this is, you know, today, the, the process of accreditation is, this is what governs our education system today. And so this is what I encourage people is, as, as a learner, you know, you do have the right to, to share your personal, you know, your personal experience, your personal thoughts as to, you know, what you've heard. You know, and that is, that is your right. And this is what I encourage you as an ally is, is to share that, that experience. That, that is one of the ways that you can encourage your, your family or your friends as to, you know, beginning this, this journey of allyship, you know. So I, I really hope that, um, I know that um, cultural appropriation is a, a big thing that, you know, everybody's worried about. And again, I, I always go back to that notion as to everybody has the, the right as a learner to share your experience. Yeah. When it comes to receiving financial rewards for sharing it. Sorry, I left that out. <laughs> <laughs> that was hard to put with me. <laughs> uh, I, I hear what you just said. Yeah. When it comes to monetary rewards for sharing, I, I don't know if that's the best way to put it. Well, that's that's how I would answer the the question. Is, still the it's it's still from the same context as to as to actually teaching uh, what you've heard that uh, you need to go through a process of of earning it, and and that's the process of evaluation. And usually for for us as elders and knowledge keepers. We, we do have our own processes of how knowledge is to be transferred from one person to the next. And it is a permittable process. It is to be given. So, so that is the, the difference in being a teacher compared to being a learner. And, and that's what we speak about is to understand where you are in that relationship. And then, and this is where we speak about is the appropriation component of it. 
is is when those notions become uh, disrespected, and, and that's where you know for a lot of our people today that uh, we we see a, a few people out there that you know sadly uh, this is uh, the hard thing with technology is there's there's a lot of people that have learned online today and that's all they know and so that's the the hardest thing for us as as elders and knowledge keepers today is uh, technology is is against how how we have taught and that's one of the challenges we have today that faces us Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Is this working? Yes. yes. <laughs> now it's working. <laughs> um, I just said that uh, the talk was very thought provoking and uh, mind opening and that there's a lot more for us to learn. Um, I feel like we've just scratched the surface. Mm -hmm. And then the reminder was uh, that Wendy said that she might sing for us and I'm hoping that she hasn't forgotten that. <laughs> 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 I will, I will. So this is, uh, for us, many, 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 many communities across the country. And, and sadly, you know, that um, they're all not First Nations, that um, a lot of towns are facing this as well is um, we have many, many different water issues today. And, and uh, the terrible thing is it's going to continue. That's, uh, that's the terrible news moving forward. And especially after the report that was brought out yesterday by, uh, you know, the, the climate change, that um, we're, we're going to face a very hard future and you know and sadly um you know this is the the consequence of our lifestyle and and we can't blame a government for that and you know we can't expect a government to fix it uh, this is a global issue and this is sadly you and i we, we have to change what we're doing. Um, we, we can't, in that notion, you know, blame a particular government. Um, so so that's, that's honestly how I would answer that, you know, like um, there's, there's a historical amount of issues that have built up, um, you know, the water quality on First Nations, we all know that. But uh, how to solve it, you know, that's that's the real question, you know. And I always believe that education, innovation, and research are the answer. You know, I really believe that, you know, being here, if we invest, you know, in the technology, 
that we can find those answers and and that's my that's my personal belief and you know but it would take all of us to to invest in that and to make change so i always try to be hopeful and optimistic <laughs> so so that's my wish because you know i i honestly don't want to see a hundred years from now where you know our our children cannot fish you know and and sadly that's what that report said is um you know the experiences we all had growing up you know future generations are not going to have those experiences and that's upsetting and so i think saying that you know we we really need to 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 think ahead and you know what can we do you know as individuals to to make change and i think that's the the things that we we need to think about as to how can we contribute to that we can take one or two more questions one over here oh, sure. yeah. Just wait for the Yeah, Sorry. How's that? Better. My question is about the concept of having a special day, which is in film that the we celebrate Indigenous cultures uh, Indigenous Day uh, as a public holiday. What what are your thoughts around that? <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I I think like when when it first began um really i was very thankful for it and and the 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 reasonings uh for that you know is for i always think of uh, our nation that um you know we have contributed a lot to to society and and this is uh, the things that i was really hoping to um to to share is there's a lot of things that we we do today in society that are truly indigenous and and those are things that um they're they're so ingrained in in what we do today that uh we don't even realize that they are they they are indigenous things you know and and some of them are are pretty common today that we just don't even acknowledge where it all originated from you know so simple things as to uh sunglasses you know that was an indigenous invention you know canoeing kayaking snowshoeing all those things most of the sports we do 85% of the foods we eat are indigenous foods from here so so this is these are the things that we speak about is like uh we you know my I would always get a kick out of my dad cuz um he would always say that uh he's like he's like Canadians are are more indigenous than they would like to admit <laughs> <laughs> and and I got a kick out of him cuz I was like yeah you're right you know that um there's so many things that we do in our day-to-day -day lives that we don't even notice today and so so when they came up with that national day i was like you know it's good you know cuz i didn't realize how many how many immigrants we have you know and and especially that we're going to have in the next decade you know that more than 50% of our population in 10 years will be immigrants like new immigrants and and sadly our history as Canadians and as indigenous people are are not being told or shared and so so that has always worried me and 
I believe that, you know, having a, a national day like that is important to, to create that type of awareness and advocacy that is needed. And so, so I really hope that one, it continues. Um, I have to admit personally that um, I find that I work more <laughs> during those days that um, we, we tend not to get a day off. <laughs> so, so that's usually what happens on, on National Aboriginal Day. <laughs> Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. I wanted to ask you about uh, the reserve system, which you touched on very briefly in your presentation and how it was a creation of the Indian Act. Now, I'm assuming that under reconciliation, we are trying to eventually get rid of the Indian Act. Do you think there will still be reserves at that point? I'm talking years in the future post reconciliation. Will we still have a reserve system that's perhaps controlled by Indigenous people, or do you think that we'll be eliminating that idea altogether? So this Trudeau government, um, one of the campaign platforms that uh, he had committed himself to was uh, to, to eliminate the, the Indian Act. And uh, this past fall that uh, the federal government uh, had rolled out a replacement to the Indian Act. And um, uh, for those who don't know, uh, many of the nations across Canada have denied it. They've refused it. And... <coughs> So there's, there's many different reasons as to why they have refused it. Um, so this is uh, um, the, the other complications um, is the, the issue of land. And so a lot of communities uh, wish to keep their traditional territories. And then others um, wish to uh, maintain their, their boundaries and then others uh, wish to have more land. So, so it's very different across the country as to nation to nation. And, and this is something that um, what's sadly going on uh, with the current First Nations is they're being treated right now as municipalities. And a lot of these First Nations do not wish to be municipalities. So, so this is the, the conflict that's currently going on is this notion and, and that relationship. So, so this is the, the tough thing that the, the current government is in um, because when you look at a municipality framework that the majority of the funding comes through the province and in a treaty relationship, it's, it's a federal relationship, not a provincial relationship. So, so this is what makes the, the relationship with the First Nations and Indigenous communities hard is the, the different, um, how they want to function can be very diverse. And so the one approach doesn't work. And, and that's, the, that's been the historical problem with the Indian Act itself is we have over 500 different nations across the country which means that there's over 500 different dialects across the country. And, and this is the, the sad thing, is they've chosen one way to sort of deal with all these indigenous nations. And, and this is, you know, the, the hard thing with 
with trying to have so many different types of relationships is 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 in trying to to make them all workable so so that's something you know moving forward is is definitely going to be difficult um like i said the the issue of trust land trust is the the notion that um how uh, indigenous uh, reserves were uh, originally identified in within the Indian Act and that notion has been challenged over time and and different provisions have been granted and then others have not and this is the the hard thing is that moving forward um, with that concept of of reserves um i kind of i would like to to see the the indian act um dismantled um however the the reserve system is definitely one that um i think for for some reserves we may we may still see it continue but i think in some places we may not that um, they may take uh, sort of like a municipality format, which is which is possible. Um, but moving forward, that's that's a very hard question to to say if it'll be just one one way or the other, because um, some some of the nations are are very very different from one another as to how they how they function. So. Thank you very much, Wendy. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we could encourage Wendy to sing for us briefly before we end. Cool. <laughs>